Okay, let's go. Well, welcome to this historic Breaking Conventions, the third occurrence of this great, great festival. And uh, my talk today is titled Drugs, Divine Light, and Quantum Theory. And I'll be looking at the drug that sparked two major world religions, one of which had a vision of light that ties in very neatly with the quantum vision of light that is, is espoused today. And the drug, which is known as Homa in Persia and Soma in the Indian subcontinent, nobody actually knows how it's pronounced. Wikipedia has a question mark on the pronunciation of that. Um, it's, uh, it inspired, this drug inspired much of the Rig Veda and the spirituality of early Persia. And they're widely considered to be the same drug and were in use for up to a few thousand years before the Rig Veda was written or the sacred Gothas of Zoroaster, the Persian prophet. But there's almost no history of pre-Persian Zoroaster or indeed of Zoroaster's time because all the remnants of it were destroyed by Alexander the Accursed, as the Persians knew him, and by the subsequent invasion of, the, of Islam and the Mongols. So there's very little early history to go on, but the sacred Gathas were memorized, and thus they survived all the destruction that was to follow. Now both drugs are frequently mentioned in the sacred text, text, and I'll give you, and they're also given the status of gods, as well as sacred plants. And I'll just convey a little bit, a little flavor of the ninth book of the Rig Veda, which is also known as the Soma Mandala. It's 114... Louder? It's switched off. It's switched off. Okay. I think it's a, he thinks it's out of battery. So I will talk louder if that's... Can you hear me back there? I might need some water halfway through at this rate. Um, but um, in the Soma Mandala, there are 114 hymns dedicated to Soma. And I'll just give you a flavor of some of them. Um, it goes, In sweetest and most gladdening stream, flow pure, O Soma, on thy way, pressed out for Indra for his drink. Flow on with, with, onward with thy juice, unto the banquet of the mighty gods. Flow hither for our strength and fame. Praised by the sacred god, bards, this god dives into waters and bestows rich gifts upon the worshipper. O Soma flowing on thy way, win thou and conquer high, high renown and make us better than we are. With thou the light, win heavenly light. And Soma all felicities and make us better than we are. And there's also, I'm not going to read through all of those, there's also the Gayatri prayer, which is known as the Hindu equivalent to the um, one that goes, uh, give us this day our daily bread. Let me see. Um, which goes, behold the rays of dawn like heralds lead on high, the sun that men may see the great all-knowing God. The stars slink off like thieves in company with night before the all-seeing eye, whose beams reveal his presence. Gleaming like brilliant flames to nation after nation, with speed beyond the ken of mortals, thou, O sun. I'm not going to read through the whole, whole of it. Now Zoroaster went beyond the sun, um, seeing it as our local emissary of the divine light. The Zoroastrians also worshipped fire. And in the, in the Zoroastrian Gathas, we find out that Zoroaster's father, was a Hayoma priest. He was one of the Persian shamans who was authorized to create the sacred drink Homa and to administer it. And indeed, we also find out that he, his father, uh, Porshu Chaspa, made a batch of Homa on the night that Zoroaster was conceived, shared it with his wife, and Zoroaster was thereby imbued with the spirit of the plant and the spirit of the light. So reading, this is Zoroaster. 
and we'll read a little bit, some of this from the sacred Gathas. These are thy Gathas, holy Homa, these thy songs and these thy teachings, and these thy truthful ritual words, health imparting, victory giving. Homa grants to those how many who have long sat searching books, more knowledge and more wisdom. Of course, all those books were destroyed, destroyed by Alexander and the other conquerors. Um, thereupon spake Zoroaster, praise to Homa, good is Homa, and the well-endowed, exact and righteous in its nature, and good inherently, and healing, beautiful of form, and good indeed, and most successful in its working, golden-hued with bending sprouts, that's a clue to what it might be, and it is the best for drinking, so through its sacred stimulus, it is the most nutritious for the soul. I'll just jump to the end here. All other toxicants go hand in hand with stealing at the point of spear, but Homa's stirring power goes hand in hand with friendship. Light is the drunkenness of Homa. So this is a sacred plant, and it was in use long before Zoroaster. We don't know what the spiritual tradition was that he built upon, but he had a special vision of light as the ultimate divinity. And he propounded this and it became the religion of the Persian Empire. It had a major influence on religions that were to follow. Um, Zoroaster, he saw light as divine, as a universal self-created God. It was the first time this had ever been introduced to spirituality on earth. It was beyond description. There's no statue, there's no symbol. How can you have a statue for light? Um, and it was called Ahura Mazda. Now Ahura Mazda isn't even a name, it's a description. It means light wisdom. And in fact there were a hundred other names for this divinity of light and we will look at some of those as we progress. Um, it was also considered to be beyond human understanding beyond human comprehension, and you might understand why it's beyond understanding by the time I've finished here. But uniquely, there were positive qualities associated with this divinity, qualities of goodness, bliss, inspiration, wisdom, all nice stuff associated with the light. And the creed of Zoroastrianism is summed up in six words, which are good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And these are emblazoned on the heart of every Zoroastrian. The sort of businesses they start up are schools, bus systems, swimming pools, things that will benefit mankind because that's what their, their religion tells them to do. Um, and then it was also manifested in Cyrus the Great, a conqueror, great conqueror of the Persian Empire, but he created um, when, he invaded, when they invaded Babylon, in or conquered Babylon in 539 BCE, um, he created the first known charter of human rights. This is a drum, you can see it at the British Museum. Sarah saw it only this morning and wondered at it. And in it, he abolishes slavery. Now this is an empire which is greater than subsequent Roman Empire built on slavery. We call slavery an abomination. Um, they had this wonderful religion worshiping light, but they had absolute freedom of religion. You could worship flying pigs, anything you liked, um, when the Zoroastrian Empire, the Persian Empire came to town. You also, you couldn't be um, punished or found guilty by association with anything your relatives were done. And the Persian soldiers were instructed to treat the conquered civilians as their own. So there was no rape, pillage, looting when the Persian army came to town. And this is all stems from this religion that worships light. So what was the drug that sparked this sacred religion? This, and, and also Hindu. Um, that's a mystery. Nobody knows what Soma or Homa were. There have been books written on it. If you read one of those books, you'll think, ah, yes, that was it. Then you read one of the other books, and you say, ah, I'm confused. I wonder, wonder who might be right. Um, so there are quite a few candidates for it. One of them is Syrian rue, Paganum harmala, and this is the largest, the, the most potent vegetable source of harmaline, which is the active ingredient in the sacred vine of ayahuasca. I've, I've taken this over on its own over a period of a week, and it in, it's called a telepathine, so you can second-guess people a little bit better, you get great empathy on it, 
but it doesn't really open the gates of heaven on its own. Um, another candidate is um, cannabis. There, there's been, you know, many people think it must have been cannabis, and when in fact you, if you prepare cannabis and you eat it, you can get far higher than you could ever get by just smoking the strongest skunk. So it's a possible candidate for it. Um, it's also been thought, um, many people think it's ephedra. Now ephedra is also known as Mormon tea. I, I've picked that and consumed it when I was in Utah. It grows in the mountains there and um, it's kind of like coffee or tea. It's an interesting stimulant. When the Mormons were banned from drinking tea or coffee, they went up and brewed this, this plant up. Again, it doesn't open the gates of heaven. Opium is another candidate. Some people think it must have been opium. And they've written books and said, yes, it was opium. R. Gordon Wasson, the, the famous mycologist, thought it was fly agaric mushrooms. And um, he, made, he wrote a book about this being the, uh, the sacred soma drug. And then there was a arcane test I, text I found out about which says it was electrum. Uh, alloy of silver and gold somehow was considered to be the soma by this chap who did great studying. Even ginseng was put forward as a candidate. Um, it might have been a, a combination of Syrian rue and mushrooms, but we don't in short know what it was that inspired these spiritual thoughts in people. But we do know that uh, I hope that many of us, you know, we s seem to get spiritual thoughts when we take psychedelics. It does open us up to that side of, of nature, which is pretty good. And in fact, I, where's my copy? My book, um, Son of God, which inspired much of this, was much of that, which the kernels of it came to me on psychedelics, and then the, the chapters had to be developed and researched thereafter. Um, well, we were looking at light in all of its frequencies, not just the little bit of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're able to, well, that enables us to see things. We don't actually see the light itself. Um, but as we move towards the quantum side of it, um, I'll point out that Zoroaster had more qualities to light than the quantum physicists see, and we see that, though, in our language, in our linguistic body language, because we talk about, you know, well, our linguist body, it, it sees the wisdom, the inspiration, the divinity of light. When we get an idea, we see the light because people have been maybe shedding light on the subject. It might be in the light of experience. We talk about being illuminated by, by, with great ideas. Um, people get all lit up when they're inspired or all fired up. The state of total spiritual knowledge is enlightenment. Um, when we die, the lights go out. Uh, we use terms like brilliant and bright and dazzling to talk about ideas and great beauty. Um, even the sort of the light bulb is a universal icon for inspiration and ideas. So our language tells us what Zoroaster knew about the qualities of light. Um, oh, there's water. Whoever put that there? Thank you. So on the quantum side of it, the, the thing we know most about, of course, is photosynthesis, this miraculous process where well, photo is light, synthesis is made, so made by light. And this is the process where carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are taken out of air and water, which we can make fizzy water out of. But with the, with the agency of light, life is created, um, all the vegetable life on the planet is made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and a few other trace elements. And that's you know, leaves, flowers, trees, bark, roots. It's all done through photosynthesis. And in the oceans, we have these, these cute little um, phytoplankton and the upper surface of the water. And you can get thousands of these little critters in a single drop of water near the surface, two or 3,000 of them. They're the basis of the entire oceanic food chain. They produce half the oxygen on the planet, and their combined weight is more than all the whales, dolphins, fish in the oceans. So they're hugely important to life on Earth, and they're working with light and water. Now, 
Some of those other hundred Zoroastrian names for light. Creator of growth, nourisher, bountiful one, most abundant provider. And of course, life itself, the energy of life, is recycled sunlight. It's been, the energy has been stored in plants. It's coming out through us. Your life energy is sunlight being recycled as a human being. Um, and when, we, when you burn something, when you burn wood, the energy of the light of the sun is coming out as the flame in the fire. So when you're staring into a beautiful bonfire, which is always an attractive process, that's kind of like sun, sun gazing. It is. It's secondhand sun gazing. You don't need any special techniques to do it. And um, light itself is spirit. It's a vibration. It's not matter. And this is why the, the, the candle is universal to virtually every spiritual practice on earth. They use candles because it's the flame is the conduit between the material world and the spiritual world. Very, very sacred thing. Now, light is the agent of the, of the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force, one of the four basic forces of the universe, and it's manifested through photons, through light. And it's absolutely everywhere. Wherever you are in space, if you just see a little bit of light from a distant galaxy, you'll see that wherever you go, and that EM force is saturating the entire space there. And if you come down to the atomic level, we know that matter is 99.9% .9 empty space. It's the electromagnetic force that gives wood or metal or water or air the characteristics of, what, of being what it is. Um, now some more of those Zoroastrian names for the divine light. All pervading, all energetic, hidden in invisible creation. Now, we also know that it is the electromagnetic force that shapes giant clouds of hydrogen gas into stars. These are remarkable things which turn matter back into energy. There's something reproductive going on there. Our own sun has seven different layers to it. Um, some of them rotate at different speeds. And it's the electromagnetic force that crafts this incredible device out of a cloud of hydrogen dust. Um, it also, within those stars, uh, matter is created. So all the, you know, starting with hydrogen and a little bit of helium, everything from carbon to oxygen to calcium to silver is all created through stellar processes. All those elements in the periodic table are created in stars. 93% of your body was created in, in an ancient star. The rest is hydrogen that's been around forever. Um, so, a few more Zoroastrian names for light. Creator of stars. Creator of all things. Creator of four elements. Now, if we look at one of those stars, if you're looking up at Sirius, you've got a thousand photons, I don't know how they count these things, but about a thousand photons a second are going into your eyeball that have come all the way from Sirius um, across five and a, 51 trillion miles of space. And it's taken eight and a half years, or well, we've lived eight and a half years while the light makes that transit. But those photons haven't changed at all from the time they left Sirius to the time they reached the back of your eyeball. And they haven't lost any energy. And if you ask them why, well, they say, well, why? I was there and I was there. Because as you approach the speed of light, time slows down. When you go past it, time slows backwards, as they used in the, the movie Interstellar and various science fiction books use it. But if you're at the speed of light, there actually is no time. It's light is always in the now. Um, so wherever it is, it, it doesn't really acknowledge the fact that it took eight and a half years to go somewhere because it, it didn't for the light. And maybe this is, happens when, when light product, like things are co-entangled, photons are co-entangled. We see how can they communicate across that space instantly? Well, to them, there is no space in their existence. Um, so others are asked your names for light. Never changing and timeless. So, light is always in the now. Um, and uh, 
as well as being outside of time, light is outside of space. It's a hard concept to get your head around, but it's a vibration. Sound needs something to vibrate in. Light doesn't. It doesn't need a place to be. Um, and uh, it's a very, it doesn't have to be anywhere to exist. Uh, we find that very hard, but um, Zoroaster names for light, and I'll come back to that in a second, but Zoroaster names for light without beginning, without end. Of course, a beginning and an end imply time, and there is no time for light. Without body, formless, timeless again. Um, light is also invisible. So when you're looking up at the night sky, it's flooded with sunlight, but it's dark until it sends some information to us and says, oh, here's the moon, here's Jupiter, here's Venus. But otherwise, it's completely invisible. And, and, and when you're looking, you're looking at me, you're looking at the walls, you're actually getting information about me, um, but you actually can't see the light any more than you can see the light that is sending messages to your mobile phone or your radio or your television. That's all frequencies of light being used to convey information. Our body cells communicate with photons. Neurons in our brain emit photons. Bacteria communicate with light, and, and it's believed now that all cells communicate with light because a cell is part of a larger body, and if the cells don't know what's going on, if they can't communicate, nothing's going to work. So it's just, and of course we, we, we x-ray, uh, Wi-Fi networks, all of this communication is done with light. There's even a magnetic portal that connects sun to earth, comes off the sun's corona, off of the earth's electromagnetic field. Every eight minutes, these two bits of the portal, it's the diameter of earth, they join together and tons of high energy particles pass forth between them. This is NASA. NASA can't, well they can believe it, but they said they wouldn't have if they didn't have four satellites checking it out. Um, well, there's the cells communicating with light, there's the magnetic portals connecting sun to earth, and here's some more Zoroastrian names for light. Invisible, connected with all, all knowing. Okay, and um, it's fine. Um, so, coming back to light being outside of time and outside of space, it's the only thing that could have existed before the Big Bang, because it doesn't need a universe. It doesn't need a place to be. And perhaps it was a big whoosh instead of a big bang, because a big bang is what happens when we explode matter and turn it into energy. But if energy is coming into matter, well, we don't know what the sound would be, because we've never actually done that. But, you know, the scientific concept is that there was something smaller than an atom, which uh, came from, you know, that's the mirac only miracle they asked for, as Rupert Sheldrake puts it and that that suddenly expanded into everything. But, you know, perhaps it was energy existing in nothingness that condensed into somethingness. It's, they're both kind of in, very hard to figure out, but, um, well, that brings us to, well, a couple more Zoroastrian names for the divine light. Root of creation, without cause, cause of all causes, creator of the universe, invisibly. So, now we come to Richard Feynman, that wonderful pot-smoking, bongo-playing physicist, um, who famously quipped, anybody who says they understand quantum physics doesn't understand quantum physics. They haven't studied it far enough. A um, couple more Zoroastrian names for the divine light. Beyond reason, cannot be understood and all understanding, they add to that. Now, I could have mentioned, uh, I mean, one thing Zoroaster didn't come across was E equals MC squared, um, but then Einstein posited afterwards, after the Amer Americans proved his theory right at Hiroshima, he said, I wish I had become a watchmaker instead of a physicist. And even the great Nikola Tesla, who was a contemporary of Einstein, was horrified by E equals M squeeze squared, and he said only grief can come to mankind as a result of this discovery. So, this all arose 
out of the book I wrote, which really started off just with the knowledge that our son was a living, a, a, a spiritual entity, a celestial being, rather than a dead, dumb ball of gas, which is what we're told. And this was very fundamental to Zoroastrian understanding, also to the uh, Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten, but we don't know what drugs he took, so I haven't really talked about him in this lecture. And um, the most exciting thing was leading from the, the awareness of stellar consciousness, so many other things follow. It's like the missing key to the cosmic jigsaw puzzle, and the understanding of light is one of those factors, but it also takes us to an animistic understanding that consciousness pervades everything from the, from the tiniest atom to the, to the entire galaxy. And um, there's a little bit of time for questions, but I'll just leave you. There's a few other Zoroastrian names for light which quantum physicists did not come up with. And those are a few of those. So thank you very much.